This morning we're continuing in the Gospel of Mark, so if you would uh, turn in your Bibles to Mark, if you'd like to follow along with the reading of this text, Mark chapter 12. Mark chapter 12, currently Jesus is in a series of interchanges, having entered into Jerusalem in his triumphal entry, presenting himself as king to Israel, knowing that he's shortly going to be rejected and crucified. The leaders of Israel are trying to find reasons to discredit him, trying to find reasons to accuse him so they can get rid of him, so that they can retain their nation. The leaders of Israel liked their clout with the Romans, even though they hated Roman authority. The leaders of Israel were willing to do what was necessary to hold on to that so that they might retain their position of authority over the people. And actually, Jesus is going to address that very thing this morning. But we've already seen them try to trick Jesus with one question, and I'll make reference to that as we uh, begin the sermon in just a moment. But uh, now Jesus addresses them. Uh, in a parable. And let's read that in Mark chapter 12, verses 1 through uh, 12. And he began to speak to them in parables. A man planted a vineyard and put a wall around it and dug a vat under the winepress and built a tower and rented it out to vine growers and went on a journey. And at the harvest time, he sent a slave to the vine growers in order to receive some of the produce of the vineyard from the vine growers. And they took him and beat him and sent him away empty-handed. And again he sent them another slave. And they wounded him in the head and treated him shamefully. And he sent another, and that one they killed. And so with many others, beating some and killing others, he had one more to send, a beloved son. He sent him last of all to them, saying, They will respect my son. But these vine growers said to one another, This is the heir. Come, let us kill him, and the inheritance will be ours. And they took him and killed him and threw him out of the vineyard. What will the owner of the vineyard do? He will come and destroy the vine growers and will give the vineyard to others. Have you not even read this scripture? The stone which the builders rejected, this became the chief cornerstone. This came about from the Lord, and it is marvelous in our eyes. And they were seeking to seize him, and yet they feared the multitude, for they understood that he spoke the parable against them. And so they left him and went away. Again, may the Lord bless his word to our hearing this morning. Now again, I already made mention of the fact that this is really the, the, uh, the beginning of an interchange that Jesus is having uh, with the leaders of, uh, of Israel. And last time we saw that uh, they, they came to him, and they came to him with a question that they challenged him. They said, uh, by whose authority are you doing these things that you're doing? And Jesus, of course, knew that this was a trick question. If he answers it one way, they're going to... Uh, charge him with being an enthusiast if he claims God gave him this authority. And if he claims man, well, they're the only ones that could give that authority. And they would say, we didn't do it, so you're doing it illegally. So rather than telling them the truth because of what they would do with that truth, Jesus decided not to tell them. And again, from that, we saw that there are times when you do not tell other people the truth because they do not deserve to hear it. Uh, when it's casting pearls before swine, when those people are going to take the truth and reject it and they're going to turn and abuse you, those are the times when you can withhold the truth. Now, in most cases, you are to share. You are to speak the truth. You are to tell others about Jesus Christ. But again, there are times when it's right not to. But now we need to notice this that even though Jesus did not tell them what they wanted to hear, he didn't answer their particular question, it doesn't mean that he didn't have anything to say to them. He does tell them a parable. 
Now, one thing we saw about parables before is that parables are actually meant to withhold truth from certain individuals. And then Jesus, of course, as he explains it, would communicate truth through those things. Parables are not actually meant to be concrete illustrations that make it easy to understand the truth. Parables were actually spoken to hide the truth from certain individuals. Now, the interesting thing that happens here is that Jesus speaks this parable to them, and in a sense, that is an act of judgment. But they understand partly of what he is saying, and they understand that what he is talking about is an act of judgment, that he is warning or forewarning against them. Now, this morning, I want us to consider two things from this parable, and, and the first thing is what Jesus was actually saying to them. What did this mean? to them. But secondly, what is he saying to you and to me through this parable? Because it also includes us. Well, first of all, what was Jesus saying to them? And this is a truth that so much of the church has actually missed today, but I'm hoping that we'll, we'll be able to see it. Jesus is warning them that he is taking the kingdom away from them. He is taking it away from Israel. And I would say, not to give it back because he's going to give it to someone else. He's going to give it to another people. And God's plan for Israel lies in that direction. So what is this parable actually saying to them? Well, Jesus says that there was a man who planted a vineyard. This man, of course, is the father. The vineyard is the kingdom of heaven. The vine growers are those that, or the ones that he rented it to are Israel. Basically, what Jesus is referring to is the fact that the father actually brought Israel out of Egypt through Moses. He built this vineyard or basically planted his people in this land, Palestine, through Joshua. And then, of course, he gave them in this land his worship. He gave them his laws, and he gave them a particular charge. The charge was that they were to bear fruit. They were to bear the fruit of the kingdom. Uh, which, of course, is not um, you know, the kind of fruit we see growing in fields out here or the kind that's often used as an illustration, but rather the fruit of godliness. The Lord wanted certain things from them. He wanted their worship. He wanted their obedience. He wanted them to be a light to the nations, basically a teacher to the nations that all nations might eventually know the Lord. Did you realize that that is really what Israel was supposed to be doing? Sometimes we think that the Lord just congregated them there to keep them separate from all the other nations and let everybody else remain in darkness. But it was meant to be a witness to the nations. They were meant to be a light to the world that others might come to know God. Now, the problem is they didn't become light. Instead, they were disobedient. Instead, they became idolaters. Instead of light, they basically became darkness. And so the Lord would send his prophets. Those are the ones meant by these servants in this parable. He would send them to receive produce, but in this case, what he really sent them to do was to bring them to repentance in the hopes that they would turn from their sins and begin to bear the fruit that the Lord originally intended them to bear. But as we see from this parable, and as we know from the history of the Old Testament, they did not listen. They would not hear what the prophet had to say, but many of them they mistreated, many of them they also killed. So what is the owner of the vineyard to do? Well, he has one left scent, one that he says they will respect, and that is his son. And of course, we know that that's the Lord Jesus Christ the one who is the greatest of all the prophets, the one to whom all the prophets actually pointed to, the one who is the image of the Father, who explains the Father, the one who is God in human flesh. If they're going to respect anyone, it should be him. But again, our Lord Jesus Christ, when he comes into the world, if you read in the early chapters of Matthew, we find that the, the land of Israel is characterized by darkness. And Jesus, as it were, is like, light that is introduced into this darkness. He is like a light that is rising and shining to give light to Israel. But again, they didn't respect him. They didn't receive him. 
but they rejected him. They killed him. When they saw him, they said, this is the heir. Let's kill him, and then the vineyard will belong to us. Well, in a certain sense, of course, killing the son is not going to give you the vineyard, but they thought it was. They thought they would be able to hold on to their clout in Israel, their position of honor and leadership, if they got rid of the son. Because if Israel followed Jesus, the Romans would come and take away their place. And so they would not have that. They did away with the son so that they might be able to retain Israel so the Romans wouldn't come and take it away. Now, again, we understand that all of this is according to the father's plan. This is exactly what he intended, though he didn't, of course, inspire the evil that was behind it. Jesus tells us in our passage that the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. That was all a part of God's plan. This doesn't excuse what Israel did, but, of course, it tells us why the Lord allowed it. So what is it that the father or the owner of the vineyard was going to do to these vine growers? He says that the vineyard was going to be taken away and it was going to be given to others that would produce its fruits. And let me ask you what actually happened in church history. But the Lord sent the armies of Rome against Israel and actually took that nation away from them. They destroyed the temple and the worship of God and the kingdom was taken away. The very ones who's whom they sought respect from, uh, the very ones that came and took the vineyard away from them. The Lord gave it to another people. Now, one question we need to ask here is this. Is the Lord simply taking the, the nation or the, the kingdom of heaven away from those particular leaders, but he's reserving it for the rest of Israel? Actually, that's not the case because the Lord warned them as he's entering into Jerusalem. Actually, it was after that, but before he gives the Olivet Discourse with regard to destruction of the temple, the Lord says that he was going to cause the righteous blood or the blood of all the righteous that has been shed on the face of the earth. He was going to cause it to fall upon that people. And it wasn't just the leaders, but the nation of Israel that were gathered before Pilate. When Pilate says, what shall I do with your king? And they said, crucify him. And he says, why? What, what has he done? He's really done nothing. Pilate didn't want innocent blood on his hands, but the people said, his blood be upon us. And he was not talking about, they were not talking about his atoning blood. But they were talking about the guilt of his murder. Let it be charged to us and let it be charged to our children. And that's exactly where the Lord charged it. All the righteous blood ever spilled because they spilled the blood of the righteous one fell upon that nation, which is why they suffered such horrible things in 70 AD and why it's really never been fully restored. So the Lord clearly took it away from Israel. He took it away from them for murdering his son. And he took it not just away from the leaders, but for the people who cried out for his blood. Now, I want you to notice the chief priests, the scribes, and the elders did not understand everything that he was saying here, but they did understand this, that he was speaking against them. And so they wanted to seize him, but they didn't because of the people. Now, let's, let's just stop for a moment and go a little bit be behind the scenes to try to figure out where it is that Israel went wrong. Why did they fail to bear the fruit that the Lord actually called them to bear? Well, it was because of the nature of the covenant that God had made with them. Uh, God had given them his law, as we already saw when he planted them in the land. He told them what he wanted them to do. But where did he write that law? You know, what was it encoded on? It was on tablets of stone. Uh, two tablets of stone, which were kept, as you know, in the Ark of Covenant in the temple. It was not written on their hearts. Now, this law, as I mentioned before, was not meant to save them. It's not something that you keep in order to be saved. But the purpose of the law, Paul tells us in Galatians, was actually as a school teacher, a tutor, to point them to Jesus Christ. The Mosaic Covenant was actually added to the Abrahamic Covenant as a means to teach Israel their need of the promised seed of Abraham. 
to drive them to that promise that was contained in the Abrahamic covenant. And if they had listened, if they had seen that, if they had trusted in the seed of Abraham, which was to come, the Lord Jesus Christ, even back in the Old Testament, then they would have been saved. God would have written that law upon their hearts. God would have changed them. He would have transformed their lives. And they would have borne that fruit. Actually, some people did. There were very few. It was always just a remnant, but there were those who saw that message. There were those who actually received the Lord Jesus Christ, but most of them did not. Most of them were unconverted. Most of them remained the enemies of God. And most of them looked at the law as the means by which they would actually make themselves right with God instead of being the means to show them that they really could not be made right apart from the grace of God. That's what the law was meant to teach them. And as a result, they all fell, not all of them, of course, most of them, fell under the curse. That's why they were in this situation. And that's why the Lord was bringing judgment on them. That's why their hearts were hard. Now, the author to the Hebrews actually tells us, quoting the Old Testament, to point out what was going on here. Why Israel failed and it was because of the nature of the covenant God made with them. He says this in Hebrews chapter 8, verses 7 through 9. For if that first covenant, which is in this case the Mosaic covenant, had been faultless, there would have been no occasion sought for a second. And the second is the one that the author to the Hebrews is arguing, which is better. And that is the new covenant. For finding fault with them, he says... Behold, days are coming, says the Lord, when I will effect a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not like the covenant which I made with their fathers on the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt. For they did not continue in my covenant, and I did not care for them, says the Lord." I want you to notice a couple of things about what the author to the Hebrews is saying here. First of all, he's saying that God's covenant was a good covenant. There was nothing wrong with that covenant. The problem wasn't with the covenant. He says, finding fault with them. The problem was with them. This covenant could not make them good because it didn't have the ability to change their hearts. Now, he said then he would make a new covenant, one that would remedy that situation, one that would take that law and write it upon their hearts. Now, we're going to come back to that in a minute because that is key to our actually fulfilling or our actually doing what Israel was unable to do. But because of this fault with them, because they wouldn't continue in his covenant, because God didn't care for them, because they were unconverted, God was taking the covenant or taking the kingdom away from them. Now, not all of them, but the majority of them, and he was going to give it to others. Now, let me just simply say that uh, God has moved from working with Israel in the old covenant to working with Israel in the new covenant. But again, this is not just Israel he's working with, but he's working with both Jews and Gentiles. He is giving it to others. And I believe what this means is that he is finished dealing with Israel as a nation, though he is not finished with dealing with, with Israel altogether. And we'll get to that under this second point. The Lord says, I'm taking the kingdom from you, I'm taking the vineyard away from you, and I am giving it to others. Who are these others that he's referring to? Well, he's actually speaking about you, and he's speaking about me, and he is speaking about everyone who trusts in the Lord Jesus Christ. He is talking about the church, including the Jews who believed. We need to realize that not everyone in Israel was, was hard-hearted. Not everyone misunderstood what God had intended. Not everyone looked to the law as a means to save themselves. Some of them actually learned the lesson the law was teaching them. They looked to the Savior, and they were saved. There were people actually looking for the Messiah. And when Messiah came, they received him. I want you to, to notice what Paul writes to the Romans. 
that what those who received Jesus Christ actually received was what Israel was seeking after. It was the fulfillment of everything that God had promised Israel. I mean, that's what Jesus was doing there. He was the fulfillment of the promises. He presented himself to Israel as king. And had they received him, they would have received everything that God had promised to them through the covenants, but they didn't. However, there were those who did. And they actually entered into, as it were, this new covenant. And they did not lose the kingdom. Paul writes to uh, the Romans, what then? What Israel is seeking, it is not obtained. But those who were chosen obtained it, and the rest were hardened. Whatever it is Israel was seeking after, those who received Jesus Christ actually gained it. They received the fulfillment of the promises, the fulfillment of the covenants in the Lord Jesus Christ. If you look at the olive tree that's mentioned in Romans chapter 11, and how the natural branches that didn't believe on, on the Lord Jesus Christ were broken off and cast away, you'll notice that the tree wasn't stripped of all of its branches. There were still natural branches that stayed in the tree. In other words, those Israelites that actually trusted in the Messiah were able to hold on to their tree. They were able to remain in the blessings of the covenants that God had actually made with them. <clears throat> and I want you to notice as well that even those branches that were broken off, even national Israel, are not without hope. Now, God did not say that he was going to gather all those branches together and plant another tree and put them on that tree. But what he said is, if they don't remain in unbelief, that God is able to graft them back into their own tree again, the same tree that the Gentiles are being grafted into, which is that other nation or those others that the Lord is entrusting now, the care of the vineyard. I hope that makes sense. There, there really aren't two different plans here. Israel didn't believe. They were broken off. The branches that didn't believe, Gentiles were grafted in. If Israel is going to trust in the Lord and come back to the Lord, they're going to be grafted back into their own tree. There aren't two separate plans or something different than what God is doing now in the future for Israel. But basically, Scripture tells us he turned to the Gentiles to make them jealous so that they would come back in and receive the blessings that God originally intended for them. This is their tree. This is their covenants. This is what God intended to give to them, but they rejected it when they rejected Christ. The Gentiles received it. They enter in, and they, they get to participate in all those blessings. If Israel does not re, you know, remain unrepentant, then they can come in as well. But the point is, trusting in Jesus Christ and, tr and receiving him through the gospel is their hope and their only hope not a separate, different kind of plan where you turn back again to the old covenant way of doing things because all of that, according to the author to the Hebrews, is gone. So anyway, I, I brought back the first point into the second point just to help you understand that, but the idea is the Lord has taken the vineyard away from the Jews, from, from the natural uh, branches, from Israel, as it were, and has given it to others who believe in the Savior. They are the ones who were grafted into the tree. So the point, again, at this point is this. The kingdom is given to you, though it's been taken from them. And that you now have the rights and the privileges and the obligations that the Lord originally placed upon Israel. Because now you have the worship of God. And you are to worship and glorify him. You have his law. He's given it to you, and he wants you to obey him. Your commission is now to be the light of the, of the world. Whereas Israel was before, now Jesus makes the church the light of the world, and he sends us out to make disciples of all the nations. You are to shine that God may be glorified. You are to bear fruit. You are his people, the ones who have repented and believe in his son. Now, wait a minute. I mean, look at what happened to Israel. You know, Israel was given this obligation. Israel was given all these privileges, and Israel failed. How are you going to be able to do what Israel was unable to do? Now, doesn't that concern you a bit? It, it concerns me. But the Lord has made uh, provision for that because of the nature of the new covenant. 
Now, he talks about the old covenant, how they didn't continue in it, and I didn't care for them. But I'm going to make a new covenant, not like that covenant, and this is the covenant I'm going to make now. And listen to what the author to the Hebrews says now in Hebrews 8, verses 8 through 12. I will effect a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not like the covenant which I made with their fathers. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws into their minds, and I will write them on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. And they shall not teach everyone his fellow citizen and everyone his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for all will know me from the least to the greatest of them. For I will be merciful to their iniquities, and I will remember their sins no more. You see, there is a difference in the new covenant, isn't there? Because the law is no longer written just on stone, but it's written on your heart, which means that God gives you a love for that law. He changes your nature and makes you want to do what he calls you to do. He makes you want to love him and to love others. He makes you want to share Jesus Christ with others. Again, he, in this passage I just read, he, he also distinguished it from the old covenant. They shall not teach everyone his fellow citizen and everyone his brother, saying, Know the Lord. That's what they did in the old covenant because it wasn't able to affect the salvation. Basically, know the Savior through the types and shadows. No, Jesus Christ is now fully revealed. Now we see him. Now we know him. And by the, the grace of the Spirit, his law written on our hearts, now we love him. Now we trust in him. So the Lord has given you a new nature so that you will obey. He is changing you from the inside out so that you will worship him. And not just here, but with your whole life so that his commission will be complete. So God has made provision. Seeing Israel's failure again is a lesson to us. No one can justify themselves by their works. It can't be done. You need to trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the one who will fulfill the obligations for you, and he is the one who will fulfill them in you. He will actually transform you into someone who can do what he has called you to do. But let me just uh, give you a reminder here, because again, this can be somewhat austere. We, we look at our lives and we say, wait a minute, I don't actually see myself doing what I, I think I should be doing as I consider what the Lord has called me to do and as I consider the fact I'm supposed to bear this fruit. I'm, the kingdom of heaven isn't really advancing as it should through me. What's, what's wrong? Why isn't it working? Well, there's one thing you do have to remember, and that is that even though you have this new nature, your desire to do what is right and wrong can vary depending upon how much you have of the Spirit of God. There is something that you need to do which is what we've been looking at in the evenings. You need to be filled with the Spirit. You need to use the means of grace, and you need to make sure you cut off all these worldly influences that are all around you that are continually quenching that love of the Spirit of God in your hearts. You need to be strong in the Spirit, but you can't be strong in the Spirit as long as your heart is going after the world. You've got to cut that off, and you've got to turn your heart toward the Lord, read his word, pray, seek the Lord, worship, worship him with your whole life. And use the means that he gives to us also in the Lord's table. We're going to be looking at that in the evening. So if you were to bear the kind of fruit that, that the Lord wants of those who are in his vineyard, you have to be filled with the spirit of God. You have to do what's necessary to be built up in Christ. So there is, as it were, a work for you to do. It's not a work to save yourself, but it is a work to strengthen God's grace in you so that you can do more of what he calls you to do. So again, I would encourage you to do what the Lord commands you to do and think about what you're doing with your lives. Think about where you're investing your time. Think about where your heart is. Is it invested in the kingdom of heaven and bearing the fruit that he calls you to bear? Or is it invested in the world and the things of the world? Are you trying to make your mark out there so that other people can look at you and praise you? Or are you trying to make your mark, as it were, in the kingdom of heaven by becoming the servant of all so that God will praise you? There's a big difference between those two things, 
and a big difference in the outcome of your life while you're here in this world. While we're here, we should seek to bear as much fruit as we possibly can for the glory of God, and that's the only way to do it. We have to have a heart for him. Now, just one final word for those who, of you that are here this morning that may not have trusted in the Lord and aren't bearing that fruit. We talked about how there can be branches, you know, that are, look like they're connected to the vine but really aren't connected because they're not bearing fruit. And we've seen, although I think I may have forgotten to point out, what happens to those branches after they're cut off. Men gather them and throw them into the fire. That, that also shows that these branches were really not the Lord's. If they don't bear fruit, they're cut off and they're thrown into the fire. Israel, unbelieving Israel, didn't bear the fruit of God's vineyard. God cut them off and threw them into the fire. What is the fire that he's throwing these people into? It's, it's hell. It's that thing that nobody hears about today uh, because it's not very popular, but hopefully I can talk to you because you understand that that's what the Bible teaches, that's what it warns. We went to a funeral service and the gospel was being preached and the fear of death was presented, but nothing about hell and nothing about sin. Hell is a very real place and there are people who go into it every day. And the only people who are safe from hell are those who have trusted in Jesus Christ and whose lives actually show that they are by bearing this kind of fruit that the Lord wants us to bear. So if you are like the Jews that didn't bear that fruit, or if you're like these branches that didn't bear fruit, your end is going to be the same end as it was for them, which is hell, unless you repent and trust in Jesus Christ and begin to bear that fruit. So what are the applications, again, for us today? Well, I, again, we need to remember that God's dealing with mankind is through the church, is through the gospel. And if we're going to deal with, with Jews, we need to deal with them through the gospel as well. They need to receive the Messiah if they're going to be saved and, and not wait around for a plan B, which is not going to come around the corner. They have got to trust in Jesus now. And I believe God will be faithful to bring in those whom he will. As far as us, what's our obligation? Well, the vineyard has been given to us. I mean, we've come into Israel's blessings, and we now are to be the light of the world. So let's do what's necessary to become the light of the world. And if there is no light shining from you, there is this warning that at a certain point, the Lord's going to remove you from, from these blessings and privileges Unless you repent and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, thankfully he is very long-suffering and very patient. But let's not wear his patience or, as it were, sin that grace may abound and so forth. Trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. If you were not the Lord's, trust in him. If you haven't professed him publicly, profess him. If you really believe in him, own him and profess him before men. Jesus says if you do so, he will confess you before the Father. But if you don't confess him before men, he will not confess you before the Father, and you do not want that to happen on the day of judgment because that is what's going to happen to the goats that are on his left. May the Lord then take his word and apply it to us this morning as we need to hear it. Let's, let's bow in a moment of prayer and let's ask the Lord to take what we've heard and to use it in our lives.